Hey, I'm Jason, and this is Supply and Demand Daily, where I tell you what we learned about the economy today. Unfortunately, this is another day where I don't have any major economic indicators that were scheduled for release this Monday, May 23rd, 2022. So instead, I'm going to talk about inflation, specifically the idea and the fact that you've been paying more at the gas pump for the better part of a year now. You're paying more for groceries and you're paying more to go out to eat. Pretty much every single good and service that you consume, for the most part, is going up in price. And so this is the consequence of what we call, what we have te- what we have termed inflation. And I want to address a hypothesis that's making its way around the internet that's being propagated by a Berkeley professor whose name is Robert Reich. He is the former Secretary of Labor under the Clinton administration, and he has a brand new but actually very old way of explaining this inflation thing to tell you who you should be mad at about the current inflation situation, the fact that these cost increases are eating into your budget. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is show you, in case you're not familiar with this argument, which is new, but like I said, very old. People have been blaming uh, what what he's going to talk about, which is corporate greed, and then he's going to talk about market com- concentration. But people have been blaming blaming corporate greed or business greed uh, for inflation for a very long time. And when I say long time, I mean hundreds and hundreds of years. It's kind of the oldest explanation for inflation in the book. So um, I'm going to show you, in case you're not familiar with these videos that have been circulating around the web, I'm going to show you one of those. And then I'm going to do some, I'm going to show you some empirical, uh, maybe not exactly empirical, but I'm going to show you some charts and data that are going to help us actually figure out whether or not this is a really good or effective or reasonable explanation for why all of these things are happening. So I'm going to get right into it and get out of the way here. And here we go. I have this video pulled up. It is a YouTube short, so about a minute. Inflation, inflation. Everyone's talking about it, but ignoring one of its biggest causes, corporate concentration. Now, prices are undeniably rising. But everybody's ignoring the deeper structural reason for price increases, the concentration of the American economy into the hands of a few corporate giants with the power to raise prices. Corporations are raising prices even as they rake in record profits. For example, in April 2021, PepsiCo raised prices, blaming higher costs for ingredients, freight and labor. It then recorded $3 billion in operating profits through September. How did it get away with this without losing customers? Pepsi has only one major competitor, Coca-Cola, which promptly raised its own prices. Coca-Cola recorded $10 billion in revenues in the third quarter of 2021, up 16% from the previous year. Get the picture? The underlying problem is not inflation, it's corporate power. Inflation. Okay, yeah, that pretty well sums it up. I'm going to go back to, yeah, let's see here. Okay, so um, I was able to find some, actually a policy paper that I looked at several years ago when I was doing my undergraduate degree in economics. So we're going to look at some evidence on exactly the subject matter that Robert Reich is talking about here, which is market concentration and market power. So I'm going to show some charts that are from an Obama administration era Council of Economic Advisors policy brief that are on exactly this subject that are going to give us some metrics to look at market concentration. And then I'm going to compare those to what we know and uh, what we what we know about inflation to really sort of show you and and show me because this has been a good exercise for me as well. Is there really a relationship here, you know, over the even the long or the short term that we can ascertain and that we can verify? So the first thing that I'm going to show is I'm going to give you a brief idea of the history of inflation and the eras that I want to pay attention to more so than the post-war inflation and the post-war boom are the great inflation, which was a period between 1965, 1966 and 1982 when inflation was the highest that it had ever been 
during relative peacetime in our history. Now, we had the Vietnam War for a big chunk of that, but the Vietnam War was not a total war approach, so it was not like World War One or World War Two or even the Civil War, where it was directly contributing to the inflation, even though the spending and the resource constraints associated with that war were probably a factor, but it wasn't probably wasn't the main one, at least as far as all the research is concerned. So we have the Great Inflation between 1965 and 1982, and then we have this period, as you can see the red line here, this is the annualized inflation rate, the rate of prices going up in the economy, and we have this period called the Great Moderation. So we came out of the Great Inflation, and then we had this Great Moderation, so-called, where inflation rates were relatively subdued, and over this period, the average inflation rate was about 2.5%, and then we have the era of 2021 to 2022, which I've termed TBD because we don't really necessarily know what this is yet, and there's a lot of debate as to whether this is going to last or not. So, and then I have a table that I will post on the various accounts um, that gives a rundown, but the great inflation, average inflation rate was 6.9%, great moderation about 26 and now we're looking at 5.5%. That's the average that we've seen over the last couple of years. And so the first exhibit that we're going to look at comes from that Obama administration Council of Economic Advisors uh, policy brief. It's not really paper, it's a, it's a brief. So we're not going to really pay much attention to the orange line because in the period studied, which is 1977 to 2013, the orange line doesn't really change much. You can't really identify a trend there. It's very flat. So we're going to focus on the blue line, and that blue line is firm exit. Now, this is a proxy for market concentration because, or excuse me, it's firm entry, not firm exit. It's firm entry. Now, this is a proxy for market concentration. The logic here is that if you have a great deal of firms entering any particular industry, and if you aggregate that to the economy as a whole, but if you have a lot of firms entering any particular industry in a given year, or maybe a given few years, what that means is that there are low barriers to entry, and that also means that the threat of competition from established players, such as a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi, is not very high. So entrepreneurs see profits being made at an industry. They identified that they too can make profits in that industry and so they enter the industry and they compete the prices down maybe they think they can offer the same service or a better service for the same price or maybe they think that they can offer a better service for a lower price and so that's why they enter the industry and that's what's represented here by this blue line firm re-entry and you'll notice the entry excuse me just entry and you'll notice that between 1977 and about 2013, it went down from about 17% all the way down to about 8 or 9. Um, about 8, actually, on that chart, it's probably more like 8. Um, not labeled precisely, but anyway, went down from about 17% down to 8%. So it was basically cut in half, firm entry was. And so if you're looking at this as a proxy for market concentration, what you could say to put that in a sentence is that by this method, Metric, market concentration economy wide has actually increased by about 50%. Now, this isn't a perfect way of measuring market concentration by any means, but it is. Uh, but it's kind of hard to measure this phenomenon, and this is one way that uh, that we have to be able to do that. Again, this is from that um, Council of Economic Advisors policy brief, and this came out in 2016, uh, which is I think I read it like a year later or something when I was when I was doing my undergrad some research in my undergrad. But anyway, um, so I have high firm entry and exit equals more competition, okay? So now, what? how can we superimpose what we know about inflation onto this particular metric, which is telling us something about market concentration? Well, from the chart that we looked at a couple slides ago, the brief history of inflation in the United States, when firm entry, that is when market concentration was lowest, so firm entry is highest, market concentration is lowest, these two things are inversely related. Uh, so when market concentration was the lowest, at least as far as 
as this metric goes, was in the late 1970s, and then we started to see this downtrend going in the 1980s, and then onward down to 2013. And what do we know about that period when uh, this firm entry rate was very high, or when market concentration was very low? That was during the Great Inflation. So we had some of the highest inflation rates that we've ever seen in our history. We're talking about prices going up 15% a year. We had that happening during a time when markets, in, when these industries throughout the economy were not very concentrated at all, when we had this high rate of firm entry. And then what do we see? During the time that we see on this chart, we have this downtrend in firm entry. So that would be an upward trend in market concentration. Well, this is all during the Great Moderation, a time when, um, you know, it, for example, in 2018, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis uh, posted a research report that was called Why is Inflation So Low? Um, and actually, one of my first blog posts was back in uh, 2021 before all of this inflation started. And it was kind of about why inflation has been so low since 2008. Um, so this is, you know, this is all happening during the Great Moderation, a time of relatively low inflation. So um, this kind of looks like strike one to me. I don't know about you, but if there's really a relationship, we've been seeing this market concentration phenomenon for a long time. That's why Obama's Council of Economic Advisors put this policy brief together, because it was already an issue in 2016. But then in 2016, we had relatively low inflation, and especially in the post-financial crisis era. And this whole time, we've had relatively subdued inflation. So, so have market concentration going up and we have inflation relatively going down at least until um, a, about a year ago the second thing I want to look at is it also comes from this policy brief paper um, but it looked at the specific industries where market concentration had increased the most. And they measured that using uh, the percentage of revenue that was taken up by the uh, the top handful of companies. I think, I think pretty sure that's how they measured it. Um, and so these are all in percentages as far as um, how much that metric had increased between 1997 and 2012. And why they picked that interval specifically, that 15-year interval, I'm not really really sure. Um, it seems kind of fishy if you ask me, um, but they picked the interval, not me. And um, so we had this increase in concentration in several industries. We got transportation and warehousing on top with uh, a little over 11%, retail trade around 11%, finance and insurance. We have wholesale, real estate, rental and leasing, utilities, educational services on down the list. And so what I did was I took the corresponding price indices for these different industries, and I couldn't really pick out each one because this real estate rental and leasing it sounds like it's just rent but it really is quite a lot more than that um so i went ahead and i took the corresponding price indices at least the ones where there is a direct comparison or a close comparison from the bureau of labor statistics uh, data on prices the things that they actually use to calculate the inflation rate so you can actually break that up into multiple different industries and and groups of products and groups of services and so that's what i did to see okay between 1997 and 2012 we had market concentration increase Increase, at least according to these metrics, we had market concentration go up in these various categories. And so if that is the case, then um, and it is the case that we see inflation as a result of market concentration, right, then we should be able to pick out a pretty clear relationship between these industries increasing in market concentration and the prices charged in these industries maybe going up faster than overall inflation. Because if these things, you know, if this market concentration is the driver of inflation, then what we should see is a faster rate of increase in these categories than we see in the inflation rate for all items. So what I've done here is I indexed everything to 100. So all of the indexes, I put them at, I, you know, calculated them to set them to 100 for the beginning of the period, which is 2019, excuse me, not 2019, uh, 1997, 22 years off, but 
Anyway, so I indexed them to 100 so that they would all start from the same level to look at the change in the relationship over time, and that's what I'm going to share right here. So this red line is the price index for all items in the consumer price index, and then we have these different categories broken out. We've got food and utilities increased much faster than all items. I'll give you that. Um, that definitely occurred. But then we have some of these other categories. You know, food and apparel is what I'm using as a product for retail trade because retail just means stuff that you buy in a store so um, and the consumer price index is broken out into many different product groups and groups of products so um, broke those out between food and apparel and then we have transportation costs and a couple other categories that I didn't have room to put labels on but to put a finer point on that you know first of all if you look at this visual do we see all of these categories floating well above the uh, well above the red line which denotes the consumer price index for all items. Uh, no, if if anything, we you know we see one category that's distinctly above it, which is considerable, um, but we don't necessarily see all of these other categories, um, you know, going way beyond the the overall price index. In fact, most of them actually spend quite a deal, quite a great deal of time below the overall price index. So that's the first thing that I want to point out. And then to put a finer point on it. Um, in this column here, this first column, I've got the price increase over between uh, between 1990. I kind of did make an assumption there, which is that the market concentration, if it had increased by you know 11 percent over the course of 15 years, it probably wasn't going to change very much in the last uh, you know in the last 10. So. Um, Maybe I'll need to go back and verify that, but I think it's a pretty safe one. So anyway, um, the biggest increase, like I said, was fuel and utilities, and that was actually pretty low on the list of increases in market concentration, right? So it was a 4.6% uh, percent increase in market concentration or market power, and um, but this category had the highest amount of increase in prices. Moving on down the list, transportation. Well, transportation is is basically right in line with the all items index it's 82 and the all items index went up 81 percent and the food component of the index went up 79.5 so all of these categories are basically neck and neck with the overall consumer price index even though these were you know these are part of you've got transportation which was the highest category and then you have two different components of retail trade right food is part of retail trade so 11.2 um you know so we had we saw a lot of market concentration in there it was listed as one of the top industries for market concentration in that uh, policy brief that we that we briefly looked at and yet we don't see higher than average uh, price increases in these two categories moving on down the line we have insurance which went up quite a bit the concentration in that industry over that 15 year period it went from you know it went up by 9.9 percent but it actually increased in price by significantly less than the overall consumer price index so we're looking at 50 percent versus 81 percent and then apparel actually went down in price so that would be a major component of of retail trade so apparel went down by just shy of five percent over the 25 years ending 2022 and then uh, but but like I said retail trade was pretty high up on that list of increases in market concentration so we've got two different uh, pieces of evidence here that can kind of show us you know is there really a long-term relationship here or even a short term you know I think if there were a short-term relationship then that could certainly be a extrapolated into the long term and um, you know when we really just put some facts and data on this subject we don't see the phenomenon that Robert Reich is talking about market concentration has been an ongoing issue as demonstrated by the fact that the Obama White House commissioned a policy brief on it in 2016 before a lot of people were really talking about this issue by the way and now um, you know a similar concept this this market concentration thing has been brought up again to explain inflation. 
And um, my my conclusion here, and maybe you'll have a different conclusion, but based on the data that I've looked at, is that you know I really think that this is sort of a uh, that this is a conclusion in search of an argument. Um, Robert Reich and Elizabeth Warren for a couple years now. Elizabeth Warren is a senator from Massachusetts. Um, this this idea of breaking up large companies and uh, taxing the ever loving crap out of them. You know, two things that that these two tend to favor. It's been in the political sphere for at least a few years now, and now it's just, you know, the same idea is being used to explain inflation, or rather inflation is being used as an argument to pursue those types of policies. Now, whether you want to break up the big corporations or tax the crap out of them or whatever, it's a separate issue. You know, I know how I feel about that, and you know how you feel about that, but can we really blame this phenomenon of market concentration for inflation? If anything, it's it goes the opposite direction. Like we we looked at the chart of um, market. Con yeah, here we go. We looked at the chart of market concentration. You know, as exemplified by firm entry, and that actually coincided with an era when inflation has structurally gone down and down and down further and further and further. So whatever you want to make of uh, of market concentration and whatever you want to make of firms having this, this market power, maybe you do think it's time for Congress to step in and break them up. That's not really the question here. What I wanted to determine is, is this a reasonable argument for inflation rising? And, you know, the simple fact of the matter, at least in the evidence that I've been able to find, and hopefully or maybe you will come to the same conclusion, is that yeah, it's really not. If you want to argue for breaking up big firms because they're large and because they have market power, then just argue for that in whatever way you see fit, the same way that they've been arguing for it for the last two, three, four years. You know, um, Just leave inflation out of it. Inflation is about credit expansion and money. It's too much money chasing too few goods. This has been an established truth and verifiable by data for a long time. Going to do another video about how we can see the effects of that. Uh, but anyway, this corporate greed hypothesis, there's really no meat to it, no substance. Um, everything that Robert Reich showed in his video is ultimately an anecdote and anecdotes don't really tell you a whole lot about real world phenomenon at least uh, don't really give you a, a, a very good framework for analyzing real world phenomenon so I hope that kind of clears things up and uh, maybe and and hopefully I wasn't too biased in my assessment here um, I'll be back tomorrow with some manufacturing and services purchasing managers indices um, if you don't know what that is I'll be explaining it and what it says about the economy where the economy might be headed as well as new home sales come out tomorrow new home sales for april i've been watching the housing market like a hawk as you can tell if you've been watching my videos and we'll get some more information about what's going on there tomorrow that's tuesday may 24th 2022 and this video has definitely been pretty long i'm going to try to keep it a little shorter than that but i would like to thank you for joining me for this uh for this little episode of supply and demand daily and i will catch you tomorrow hope you enjoy the rest of your day thanks